good afternoon uh, ladies and gentlemen i have little less than 30 minutes so i'll make it quick uh are you born greetings from sri lanka um i've been a part of many uh, round table discussions about innovation and disruption uh something that i've seen co in common in most of these discussions is that people are very excited to talk about innovation they're very excited to talk about disruption but unfortunately we end up talking only about technology now remember technology cannot innovate technology cannot disrupt only people can innovate only humans can disrupt so that's why i picked this topic of creating people centric organizations in the age of disruption uh so before we move on i thought it's important to talk a little bit about disruption um uh, according to clayton christensen disruption is a process where small companies with fewer resources successfully challenge large incumbent organizations now as you can see on this graph uh the upper red line talks about depicts the journey of those large incumbent organizations they start at the low end and over time they improve product performances and move up to uh serve this uh mainstream and high end segments now when they do that they tend to overserve these mainstream and high end segments and underserve certain other segments now new entrants see this as an opportunity and they quickly enter the market to serve those underserved segments now has disruption happened yet no over time these new entrants start appealing to uh the mainstream and high end segments and that's when disruption happens i'll give you an example from blockbuster uh blockbuster started business in 1985 they were into uh renting home movies and video games um their key competitive advantage was they had access to popular new releases now netflix enters the market in 1997 they don't have access to popular new releases so they adopt a new business model called dvd by mail so you order your dvd online and then it gets delivered to your doorstep uh blockbuster doesn't take netflix seriously but over time um netflix introduces subscription based online streaming and in 2012 they uh, move into content production now that's when they start appealing to uh, the mainstream and the high end uh today netflix has 137 million online subscribers worldwide blockbuster files for bankruptcy in 2010 Now that's another point you need to keep in mind. Uh Netflix enters the market in 1997, but Blockbuster files for bankruptcy only in 2010. So it's a gradual process. Disruption is a gradual process. So I'm giving you an example from a Sri Lankan company called Pickme. Um a company that disrupted the taxi industry. They also entered the Sri Lankan market to serve an underserved segment and that underserved segment is three wheelers. We call them tuk-tuks. uh but now you can see they have moved into mini cars cars and vans disrupting the entire industry so enough about disruption now i'm going to move into five important factors i'll summarize everything in five points what do we have to do in order to create these people centric organizations and how do we face disruption uh so the first one is creating an innovative mindset not an agile mindset now i had to particularly mention that agile mindsets won't do an agile mindset is a mindset which adopts to the current situation a uh, innovative mindset is a mindset which questions the current situation now you might ask me why is this so important remember uh the fresh thinking that resulted in a company's initial success can often be replaced by a rigid devotion to the status quo uh you might have heard company ceos saying this model has worked for us why do we have to change this blockbuster asks the same thing this model worked for us why do we have to change it but over time the strategic frames that worked for you will become blinders uh the processes and procedures that worked for you can become routines uh your values can become dogmas so you need to keep on questioning uh the status quo so in other words you need to have more vuja day moments now i'm sure you have you're familiar with deja vu 
deja vu is a strange feeling that you get when you're doing something for the first time. Uh, you get this strange feeling that this has happened before. Uh, but vuja day is the complete opposite. You do something very routine, something very familiar, but you get this feeling this has never happened before. In other words, there is a degree of freshness to every routine thing that you do. It can be a routine thing like ordering a taxi. You stop and think, is there a better way of doing it? It can be a routine thing like um, uh, paying your insurance premium. You do it every year, but you stop and question, uh, why do I have to obtain insurance for my camera on days that I'm not using it? Why do I have to obtain insurance for my vehicle on days when I'm not using it? So emerges on-demand insurance. Uh, I'll quickly give you another example from the 19th century. Ice harvesting was big business. People go out, cut blocks of ice, bring them into the city, store it in ice houses. You can see an ice house. Um, then came the 20th century, the second revolution. Um, uh, people started manufacturing ice in factories. Then came the third revolution, invention of the refrigerator, where ice manufacturing shifted from factories into households. Now, remember, none of the ice harvesters became ice factory owners, and no ice factory owner uh, invented the refrigerator. Because we are so focused on our core, I think most of the speakers spoke about this, we are so concerned about the core, we completely turn a blind eye to all the other opportunities that exist outside the core. Um, so, what do we do? I think the biggest barrier for innovative mindset is the organization's architecture, the organization structure. More than 50% of the millennials, according to the Deloitte's 2018 millennial survey, more than 50% of the millennials think that our organization structures do not provide a conducive environment for new ideas to grow. How many of you have heard of uh, Jeff Bezos pizza theory? Yeah, Jeff Bezos said, if a team cannot be fed with two pizzas, that team is too big. Our teams are too big. More than that, our teams operate in silos. They don't collaborate across departments. There is no cross-pollination, which is something very important for innovation. So I'll give you some examples later. Uh, all these points will be backed by a case study. Um, then looking at innovation as a minimum viable product. Now here, you can see the first set of pictures, an innovation process that does not add value until it reaches the end point. But you see the second set of pictures uh, every stage of this innovation process adds value. Uh, so this innovation process creates value. It makes employees happy at every stage. So it's a more gradual process. You, you keep creating value on the way. I'll come back to this again. Then, um, looking at innovation as an end-to-end -end process, uh, you call this the innovation value chain. Uh, which was taken off the Harvard Business Review, uh, looking at innovation as a process so that you can spot issues, loopholes in your innovation process. Now, I'm taking you back into the organization structure. If you can see, um, idea generation, there are three pillars of idea generation. Internal idea generation, external idea generation, and cross-pollination. We focus a lot on internal and external idea generation. We completely forget Cross-pollination. Cross-pollination is when organizations allow their teams to collaborate with each other and make new ideas. So I'll come to a case study uh, from the company that I work for, Haley's Advantis. Haley's Advantis is the transportation and logistics arm of Haley's. Haley's is a large conglomerate in Sri Lanka. We are celebrating our 140th anniversary this year. Uh, so we have been stuck in the core of logistics. But last year we stopped and thought, can't we move out of this core and uh, provide end-to-end -end solutions and thereby provide peace of mind to our customers? So as a result, uh, we came up with two models. One is the end-to-end -end project management model. Um, as you can see, the red highlighted area is our core. We already operate in this core. Uh, but we 
question why can't we move into construction now remember construction is modular construction today so the logistics provider has a bigger role to play uh, in modular construction why can't we move into buying in uh, lobbying and funding where the real money is so we we actually tested this uh, model in myanmar where we erupted uh, telecommunication towers for a telecommunication telecommunication company where we front ended the whole project and uh, we also laid overhead fiber optic cables so we want to um replicate the same model in other companies you never know by 2020 we might be a construction company we we just don't want to stick to one core and then comes the second model uh, uh the most famous model the e-commerce platform we developed an e-commerce platform again the three areas highlighted here freight logistics warehousing and order fulfillment are our core areas so we operate in these core areas and we become an enabler to e-commerce platforms but by next year we want to move into developing our own custom interface we currently collaborate with another company to develop this custom interface and uh, we also want to uh, move into last mile delivery now i'm taking you back into that minimum viable product don't you think that this is a minimum viable product we currently operate in the three core areas but slowly and gradually keep on moving into adjacent areas thereby innovating um then comes the second uh, i would say this is my personal favorite redefine success by moving beyond uh, the profit principle um toba beta uh, an indonesian writer once said greed is a little more than enough in that sense uh, we are all greedy we as individuals we are greedy as companies we are greedy we never say enough um this constant pursuit of profit has led to financial meltdowns wars and extinction of countless species from this planet so i think it's a important area that we as marketers we are responsible for this and we need to talk about it and i'm very happy today many speakers spoke about the social responsibility aspect and and uh, having a a purpose driven organization more than just focusing on profits and how these purpose driven organizations create more value um i like this definition if uh, it's clear uh, the purpose of business is to make life better in a profitable way now what you see here is uh, an economic class a picture of an economic class in 1970s wow uh, now when when you compare this economic class with economic class today uh, you will realize how much our companies are focused on making profits than making lives better um so why is purpose important i think many speakers spoke about this but in a summary all our stakeholders value purpose driven organizations they prefer to work with purpose driven organizations your employees are more engaged your customers are more satisfied they're willing to pay a premium price even your shareholders see a link between purpose and organization success um so i'm taking you to another example toms now this example th there are various other examples you take uh, um companies in the same industry dunking donuts uh they say their vision is to serve delicious coffee and donuts but starbucks says um we want to inspire and nurture human spirit so starbucks says why they are in business and dunking donuts says what they are doing so you can see that more successful brands define a purpose but here uh, i'm bringing you this example because it shows the pluses of purpose as well as limitations of purpose now toms how many of you have heard of toms yeah so uh, toms uh, is a manufacturer and a designer and a manufacturer of shoes uh, so their purpose is improving lives so it's a very successful business model every pair of toms shoes that you buy from them they go and donate a pair of shoes to a needy child so everybody got connected with this purpose everybody loved this purpose especially the customers loved this purpose so 
this company saw um, their revenues growing at a compound annual growth rate of 78% between 2010 to 2015. But right now, they're struggling financially. Why? They did not innovate. Uh, the Alpagata design is what you see here. They were relying on this Alpagata design and they were selling this right from the inception. They did not innovate. So remember, I'm going back to that definition. Purpose of business is to make lives better. So you have to create a purpose which gets connected to all the stakeholders and all stakeholders need to see value. And in this instance, your customers got disconnected because they didn't see value in the purpose in the long run. Um, the third point, converting the purpose and values into actionable behavior. We, as companies, focus a lot on articulating beautiful purpose statements, but we don't convert them into actionable behavior. So as a result, our customers experience something completely different to what we promise. Good example is United Airlines. Um, their vision is to connect people and to unite the world, but their customers actually did not experience the same thing. I'm sure you can remember all these incidents where customers were mishandled, um, they were not treated properly by the employees. So what can you do? The answer is through aligning your employee experience with the customer's experience. The more you align your employee experience and you treat your employees, your employees will take care of your customers. You don't have to worry about it. Um, I'm bringing another example from a company that I worked for, Odell. Um, Odell is a large fashion retail in Sri Lanka. They operate more than 20 outlets today, right across the island. And we had a, a vision. It was actually not a purpose. We had a vision. Our vision was to provide a mind, body, and soul experience to our customers. So we, we realized that we can't provide this mind, body, and soul experience to our customers if we don't create the same experience to our employees. So we uh, ran this program called uh, Champions of Service and Inspiration, CSI, where we picked um, employees who provide exceptional customer service, we recognized them, we gave them badges, we gave them certificates, we uh, trained them, trained them in basic elements like greeting. How do you greet customers in different languages? We didn't stop from there. We linked this with a clear career progression. You work as a CSI for a year, you get um, uh, selected to be a fast tracker. You serve as a fast tracker for another year, you become a supervisor. From that point onwards, you can move up to be the CEO of the company. So um, I, I'm, I'll quote a few people here. Uh, the guy who's wearing this red tie right in the middle, uh, he's a store manager today. And most of the other guys, some have left and they're doing extremely well with competitors, uh, but they're doing extremely well uh, within the company and in the industry. Then uh, comes the fourth point, go back to basics and believe in the power of human interaction. You might not agree with me, but uh, let's just listen to this story. Um, we Sometimes we get overwhelmed with a lot of technology, with automation, with robotics and all that. Uh, we tend to forget our basics. Um, so um, as a result, you create a fear factor say by 2030, 50% of our jobs are going to be replaced by robots. My God, it, I, I'm going to lose my job. That's the first thing that comes into your mind. So let's first eliminate the fear factor and then let's look at the basics. Um, I'm taking you to a conversation which happened in 1950 between Henry Ford II and Walter Ruther. Uh, Henry Ford II is a famous automobile manufacturer and Walter Ruther is the president of um, the Automobile Workers Union. So uh, they go to inspect this uh, production line, which is 100% automated, uh, run by robots. And Henry asks Walter, 
Walt, how are you going to collect union dues from these robots? And in response, Walt asks Henry, how are you going to get them to buy cars? So this shows the paradox of automation. Yes, automation is going to replace a lot of our jobs, but there are going to be many other jobs that are being created. And uh, at the same time, uh, companies need consumers who have the ability to buy, to buy the products they manufacture. Robots are not going to buy their products. So then, let's look at the basics. This is a study done by InMoment. They focused on factors that created lackluster brand experience. Now, this was done in US. They spoke to brands as well as consumers to identify factors that create poor brand experiences. See what customers have had to say. Uh, close to 74%, about 75% of customers have said lackluster brand experience is caused by interaction with staff. Poor interactions with staff. I'm sorry, this uh, graph is not that clear. The first line says interaction with staff. Um, it can be due to um, lack of product knowledge by the staff or else it can be due to poor attitude by the staff. But look at what brands think. Brands don't think that it's a big issue. About 26% of the brands think that it's a problem. Most, the majority of the brands don't see this as an issue. Look at the second point, you'll be amazed. The lack of understanding of my needs. Close to 50% have said lack of understanding of my needs is the reason for lackluster brand experience. Isn't that the basics of marketing? Identifying, anticipating, and satisfying customer needs. So we are not doing that right. So our, 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 our consumers are not happy. Uh, same study revealed valuable factors and memorable factors. Look at the high valuable factors that they have rated in brand experiences. Number one is, of course, related to automation, self-serve checkout. Uh, number two, human interaction and being treated special. Uh, look at the memorable factors. Again, human interaction and being treated special. How have they rated uh, things like facial recognition and virtual reality? They've said those are low valuable factors for them when it comes to brand experiences. Now remember, this is going to be even more relevant in the future because we are so glued to devices, people will rely on human interactions more and more. So let's believe in that. And uh, the same study revealed uh, the preferred customer service contact preferences of their customers. Look, just forget about the old age groups. Look at the younger age group of 18 to 34 year olds. 76% of them prefers a customer service representative or a chatbot or an IVR. Right. So human interaction matters. So let's do those basics. Send your customers a birthday card, invite them to the store, tell them that you missed them last year because they didn't visit the store. So ask, send them a card and say, we miss you. These are things that you can do to create that human interaction. And of course, Technology would be an enabler to create your inter human interactions more powerful. Then we come to the last point, uh, not much of theory here. Step up in the hour of need and be perceived as a really people-centric organization which believes in people, uh, which uh, values the social responsibility part of it. Now, don't get this mixed up with purpose. Purpose is why you're in business. This is how you step up when your customers and when your people are in trouble. I'll take you to two examples. An uh, example that you guys are now familiar with, Pick Me. In 2016, uh, Colombo and suburbs faced floods. And... Um, Many of our people in the suburbs got stranded. And Pick Me immediately uploaded this SOS feature onto their app. And they sent a message to all their customers. If you are stranded, press this SOS feature. Use this SOS feature. 
and we will be deploying boats to rescue you. And if these boats can't reach you, we will alert the disaster management center so that they can send you help. Immediately, PICME became that people-centric organization which, which became a, a responsible corporate citizen. And uh, the next example is actually a video. I'll, I'll play that. So that's how a large retailer in Sri Lanka stepped up during the hour of need. Uh, so with that, I come to my last slide. I'm about, uh, I think I'm on time. Alu, last slide. Uh, uh, so you can see on one side you see a rainforest, and on the other side you see a plantation. Uh, now I'm going to leave you with two questions. One is. Which side do you think is more innovative? Which side is more creative? Which side is, has that variety? Uh, which side is more unique than the other? Is it the rainforest or the plantation? Rainforest, right? Um, so I, I'm not going to ask uh, which side is beautiful, because I made sure that I picked a beautiful picture of a rainforest and an ugly picture of a plantation. Uh, so rainforest obviously uh, is more unique than the plantation. Um, uh, another fact that you need to keep in mind is that a rainforest uh, operates on a self-sustainable ecosystem and it will last for centuries with minimum human intervention. It will only be destroyed due to human inter intervention. Uh, so then, what is the secret behind this rainforest? Every plant is allowed to grow in this rainforest. But plantations don't operate like that. If it is a sandalwood plantation, only sandalwood trees are allowed to grow. And every other tree, every other plant is removed, saying it's weed, it's inappropriate, it does not fall in line. So my next question to you is, uh, do our organizations look like rainforests or do they look like plantations? Do we allow new ideas and people to grow or do we eliminate them saying that it does not fall in line? So if you want to make a business model which will sustain for centuries with minimum intervention, make your organizations rainforests, create that conducive environment for people and ideas to grow. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention, and all the best. Thanks.